Today I will be talking on the Boxer Rebellion, which is also known as the Iho Tuan Movement. It took place in 1900, but actually it uh, started a bit earlier. And it continued uh, up to 1901 when a protocol was signed. And this treaty was one of a series of humiliating treaties that had started with the Treaty of Nanking in 1842 after the end of the uh, First Opium War. Now, one important feature of the history of China uh, is the occurrence of peasant rebellions from time to time. Peasant rebellions occurred in the past in ancient China, in medieval China, in modern China. Peasant rebellions against the feudal forces, peasant rebellions against both feudal forces as also against uh, foreign encroachment, foreign imperialism. And the point is that China surpassed probably all other countries of the world, not only in the number of peasant rebellions, but also in their depth, in their intensity, uh, and what not. Now, these rebellions, well, most of these rebellions were led by secret societies. Secret societies uh, constituted an important part of Chinese society, which is uh, not seen in our country, in India, before the Opium War and the signing of the Treaty of Nanking in 1842, the peasant rebellions were basically anti-feudal in character. But after the Opium War and the signing of the first of a series of humiliating treaties, it had assumed new dimensions. I will come to that later. Now, the point which I want to emphasize is that these rebellions or most of these rebellions, either in the earlier period or in the modern period, these were led by secret societies. Secret societies are an important, they constitute an important feature of peasant society. The Boxer Rebellion, which took place in 1900, was also directed against missionaries. It was not only led by secret societies, it was also directed against the missionaries because missionaries in China, as also in other parts of the world, in India, Indonesia or other parts of the world, they came with the flag. That is, political, foreign political control was closely tied up with the advent of the missionaries. And it was the Christian missionaries which also served as one of the instruments for colonial control or semi-colonial control. This Boxer Rebellion, it was one of the biggest of the rebellions, no doubt about it. It was a peasant rebellion. But that does not mean that only peasants took part in it because people belonging to other walks of life, the artisans, and many other people, they also took part in it. And another important feature is the participation of women in large numbers. That is also an important feature which makes China stand apart possibly from many other countries, if not all countries. Boxer Rebellion came to an end in 1901 with the signing of a protocol, Protocol of 1901. And through this protocol, the foreign powers, many foreign powers, not just the main powers, but small foreign powers, imperialist powers, they also extracted a large number of privileges, indemnities, etc., from the Chinese government, which was very weak at that time. Now, uh, this is our brief introduction, and now we pass on to the background. This anti-foreign movements, these took many forms. One definitely was a resistance movement, arm resistance, arm resistance movements in different forms. These movements were isolated in nature, sporadic in nature, not at all coordinated. As for example, in 1841, when the Opium War, first Opium War had been going on near the city of Canton, the Chinese villagers, they routed a detachment of Anglo-Indian troops. Then in 1884-85, the Black Flags, Black Flag was again a secret society, Black Flags of Tonkin, uh, Indochina side, and the border regions of South China, that is Indo on the Indochina side. They also raised stiff resistance against French encroachment, French troops. Then in, in the 1890s, there were Red Bear Bandits, another secret society, Red Bears of Manchuria, and they fought against Russian encroachment against the establishment of Trans-Manchurian Railway Line. That was what the Russians were going to do. So they opposed this construction of Trans-Manchurian Railway Line. So 
these were some instances of armed peasant resistance against foreign encroachment, not just Britain, but also France, Russia, and others also. Now, another form of peasant resistance was resistance against the introduction of foreign technology, foreign machinery particularly. You must be knowing that uh, after the coming of foreign industrial capitalism, factories were set up and heavy industries, heavy machines were being installed in the various mills. Uh, these were installed in India, these were also installed in China, as also in other countries which were, which ultimately became colonies or semi-colonies of one foreign power or another, or more than one foreign power. And their target of attack was the machine. They started destroying the machines. So machine breaking became an important feature of resistance movements of the Chinese people. And these were naturally similar with uh, to uh, Ladism. We kn you know possibly know of Ladism, uh, the Ladism that is the uh, English Chartist leader John Ladd. And uh, when the when early industrialization was going to take place, then artisans, anti craftsmen, they were uh, thrown out of work. Initially, yes, many of them were absorbed in industries, but many of them were initially thrown out of work, and so they took to Ladism. That is, they started uh, breaking down machines. Now, this type of resistance, it's a form of resistance, no doubt, opposition, no doubt, of a violent nature, no doubt. And these also took place in China in large numbers. Now, but there was a difference between the English form of Ladism and the Chinese form of machine breaking. In the case of England, machines were destroyed primarily because these were the causes of unemployment. That is the reason. But in the case of China, yes, one cause definitely was that it was the root of unemployment. That was there. But other point is that it was also foreign. Machines were foreign. Industrial capitalism that was introduced in China was a transplantation from the Western world. It was not a product of the indigenous evolution of Chinese society. So it was a transplantation from above. And they were foreign. And so the Chinese people opposed it, not just because they were causes of unemployment, but also because these were foreign. So it was in that sense a nationalist or what historians call a proto-nationalist. That is the beginning of nationalism not total na proto-nationalism, proto-nationalist resistance, proto-nationalist response to foreign encroachment. And in fact, a large number of machines, spinning machines, uh, weaving machines, uh, which were set up by the foreign foreigners, uh, both in the urban areas and also in the rural areas. These were being destroyed near Canton as also in uh, other places. So that was one point. So we have two, two types of resistance. One was the, resi the armed resistance against foreign troops. And second was, again, uh, resistance, mass resistance, violent resistance against uh, introduction of foreign technology. Why were the secret societies and the peasants, what was the connection between them actually? And why did the secret societies fail to give any organized leadership to the anti-foreign movements, which you tell were very sporadic and isolated in nature, very unorganized or disorganized, so as to say? Why is it so? Now, as to your first uh, question, mm -hmm. that is the relationship between the peasants and the secret societies. Mm -hmm. Peasants reacted to feudal oppression in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some. Uh, there were lower forms of movement, higher forms of movements mm. also. And one of the forms of the movement was to uh, leave the village, mm. go to the mountains and jungles, and in fact mountains and jungles formed uh, places of refuge mm. for all outlaws of China, mm. quote-unquote outlaws of China. In this way, they were forced to operate in a clandestine manner mm. because there was no other way. Mm. So they became part of secret societies, mm. and secret societies were based in the rural areas, mm. Also, there were secret societies 
in the urban area. So it was this feudal repression that forced them to operate in a clandestine manner mm -hmm. in this way at some point of time secret societies were formed. This, is a, this was the relationship between how they joined the secret societies. Mm -hmm. Second part is that peasant rebellions were sporadic in nature and there was lack of coordination. Mm -hmm. But it is not true for all because uh, in fact the Taiping Rebellion which mm -hmm. preceded it, mm -hmm. that is uh, 1851 to 1864, that mm -hmm. is a long period of time. Mm -hmm. It was a very one of the greatest peasant rebellions, mm. coordinated peasant rebellions. And the Boxer Rebellion, they also had their spheres of influence mm. in many parts. Coordination also means that mm. there should be a common program, political ideology, etc., mm -hmm. which was not entirely there at that time. So that could be one of the reasons why they lacked coordination, though sporadic movements were there more greater movements were also there which were not that sporadic in character. Mm. From the second half of the 19th century, foreign missionaries, we have pointed out earlier that flag and political control, these were tied up in the case of China as also in other parts of the world. Mm. Now, foreign missionaries started penetrating into China, setting up their mission buildings. They were forcing Chinese people to become converts. They were kidnapping Chinese children and converting them into Christianity. Now, these things have been going on from the second half of the 19th century. And naturally, these were very much detested by the uh, Chinese people, no doubt about it. And uh, Chinese sources, the historians of China, they mention many people, as for example, Timothy Richard of Britain, uh, Gilbert Ride of USA. Alphonse Favier of France or Anzar of Germany. Now, these people, they were the leaders, according to the Chinese. They collected intelligence about various localities. They also forcibly seized farmland. They put pressure on the law courts to give verdict in their favor. They, uh, they also bought over gangsters to bully the people. It was in this way they, the missionaries, all of them were missionaries, on, they were on for propagation of uh, Christian, Christian Christianity. And it was in this way that an, an antagonism, sharp antagonism developed between the Chinese people and the foreign missionaries. And naturally, the Chinese people protested. They responded in their own way. And in fact, after 1840, various incidents involving missionaries came into focus. As for example, there were attacks on mission buildings. There were manhandling of Chinese converts. In some cases, there were killing of foreign missionaries, those whom the Chinese people regarded as the most oppressive. They were even killed. And it was, this took place in the Yangtze Valley in many regions, in many regions. And here, a local gentry took an active part. Local gentry were very much anti-foreign. Then secret societies, we have already pointed out the role of the secret societies. All of them were involved in these anti-Christian outbreaks. And these had been going on right from the 1860s and continued in the next decades also. Now that is one feature. The other point is that that was also the period when uh, capitalism had already reached its highest stage the stage of monopoly capitalism, mm. which Lenin described as the stage of imperialism. And during that stage, capital was being exported mm. to China. In the earlier phase, we have the export of commodities from abroad mm. to China. Now, along with export of commodities, we have also export of capital. That was the, that was the main feature of the third stage of uh, the development of capitalism. Mm. And along with it, China was being divided into spheres of influence. China was being sliced up into different areas, each under the control of one foreign power. Britain here, USA there, France there, Italy there, Germany there, Belgium there. It was Japan at one point of time. Japan also entered. So these things had been going on, and, and the historians call, say that uh, China was like a watermelon, which was being sliced up into different principalities, different spheres of influence. Another important point is that 1894-95, that was the year of the Sino-Japanese War. 
Sino-Japanese War and the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, when another humiliating treaty which China was forced to sign. And to pay off the war indemnity, China had to procure loans, again from foreign countries, to pay off the indemnity, amount was huge, to pay off the indemnity, they had to procure loans from Russia, France, Austria, Germany. So, and in this way, foreign powers also ex 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 exerted more and more influence because they were the credited country. So they exercised more and more influence on, on the Chinese people, on different parts of China. And what you find is that from 1895 to 99, violent incidents started to take place in large numbers in the villages and also in the towns. Yes, there were attacks on mission buildings, attacks on the Chinese converts, no doubt. But side by side, there were uh, other problems also, feudal problems also. Banditry was one, banditry. Uh, banditry was another important feature of Chinese society. Banditry comes from the word uh, ban. From ban, we have the banditry. You are Im the state is imposing ban on someone, mm -hmm. so they are bandits. Mm -hmm. That is how the word bandit mm -hmm. emerged. Mm -hmm. It came into the English vocabulary. And side by side, as a result of the Sino-Japanese war, and as a result of the fact that more and more indemnity was to be paid to Japan, so more and more taxes were imposed on the people. So general crisis was there, and general crisis was mixed up with this specific crisis, which was emerging after the Sino-Japanese war and the signing of the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Now, it was in this way that the missionaries and the foreign powers, they intermingled, their interests intermingled. Mm -hmm. So mission buildings were started, set up to propagate Christianity, and all the foreigners were, they were Christians, most of the foreigners were Christians. So it was in this way they, that they, their interests coincided. One important point is that is the increase in population in China. Increase in population from 1750 to 1850. Mm -hmm more than doubled, 80 million to 430 million during this 100 year period. Then uh, it came down because of the peasant rebellions, because of death, hundreds and thousands of people, mainly peasants, they died because of state repression uh, sub during the time of the suppression of the rebellions. Uh, apart from the Taiping, there was a Nian movement, another important peasant rebellion, the Nian. Uh, and side by side, there was a concentration of uh, land in fewer and fewer hands. So it was the landlords who grabbed land. But the point is that even though there was an increase in population, there was no increase in the quantity of cultivable land. Because cultivable land was hardly available. So it means that there was more intensive cultivation and disposition, the emergence of landless peasantry uh, in all parts of China. There was a floating population, floating population, homeless population throughout the country. Homeless, it was this homeless population, one part of which they joined mercenary soldiers under the landlords. And the other part naturally became outlaws. Mm. They became rebels. So one part joined, mercenary, joined as mercenary soldiers, mm -hmm. the landlords, and the other part, they became outlaws. They became rebels, joined various secret societies, mm -hmm. and operated in a clandestine manner. Then there was importation of more and more foreign products, particularly textiles. In the earlier period, uh, China uh, only exported goods. There was no demand for foreign goods mm -hmm. in China. But after the OPM war and many other things, so China was being flooded with foreign goods. And so there was this industrialization in China because there was a total decline of handicraft industries as it took place also in our country, in India. Mm -hmm. Now, public resentment had been going on naturally and Shantung was the focus. Mm -hmm. Shantung was the province mm -hmm. which was the focus in particularly in the Boxer Rebellion. Mm -hmm. The people of Shantung suffered a lot because of natural disasters, because of other factors. And from the 1880s, 
it, uh, the crisis intensified to a large extent. And then we have the, after the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, there was forcible military requisition during that war period. Mm -hmm. A large number of taxes were imposed on the people to pay off the domestic loan. Mm -hmm. And the whole amount was something like 100 million tails, T-A-E-L, tail meaning one ounce of silver, 100 million tails that was imposed on the province of Shantung alone to pay off the war indemnity. These also these combined to form the crisis, which ultimately uh, contributed to the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. Sir, uh, due to this foreign aggression and the foreign control over China, the peasants and the uh, handicraftsmen, they all suffered. What was the role of the feudal lords? Uh, actually, the Manchu rule was a feudal rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very weak, and it had already uh, succumbed to the pressure of the Western powers. So uh, they actually were in alliance. Mm -hmm. they, they were only they were submitting to the dictates of the foreign powers. So they were more pro foreigners mm -hmm. than pro Chinese people. Okay. Boxers were also known as Iho Tuan, as we have pointed out at the outset. From the very late 19th century, as we have pointed out, uh, events had been, incidents had been taking place concerning the missionaries. Mm -hmm. And people were getting organized against foreign encroachment uh, in various ways. And there was one society which took an important role that was called the Big Sword Society. Big Sword Society, Chinese Ta Tao Hui. Ta Tao Hui is the Chinese name of the Big Sword Society. It was again a secret society. It organized people in many areas, many, many counties. But another society which played the most prominent role here was, uh, of course, the uh, Iho Tuan, mm -hmm. or the boxers. In English, it is translated as righteous and harmonious fists or righteous and harmonious militia. And this society was active in Shantung. Uh, it was uh, also active in other areas and there was an element of mysticism mm. in it uh, they practiced boxing they also uh, practiced oath taking taking of oaths they also believed in the use of charms they believed that when you use charms when you take charms then that would make you invulnerable mm. uh, so you can stand up to the challenge of the enemy so, so there was an, a medieval element in that, in all those things also. Another point is that women, I will come to women later in more detail, not today. Women also took part in large numbers. And in fact, there were separate detachments of women depending on their ages, mm. uh, age 12 to 18, then middle-aged wives, older wives, then widows. We have the red lantern, blue lantern, green lantern, etc. And it, it of course, uh, apart from the part, apart from uh, the number of peasant rebellions, the mm. participation of women in large numbers mm. in all these peasant rebellions uh, is also another important feature. And these boxers took, uh, they adopted a slogan, they raised a slogan, which was very uh, popular at that time. And that was exterminate the foreigners, down with the foreigners, exterminate the foreigners. It was clearly anti-foreign in Overton. It became the rallying cry for all those who definitely stood against foreign encroachment. And apart from anti-foreign aspect, it had also an anti-Manchu aspect. Mm -hmm. Because many of them felt that a Manchu ruler, the Qing rulers, they were. They had their interests intertwined with the interests of the foreign powers. They were very weak. They were submitting to the dictates. So the dictates of the foreign powers. So this Boxer Rebellion, which uh, formally started in 1900, it was also anti-Manchu in nature. That aspect may be secondary, mm. but that was another aspect. Though the primary aspect, of course, it's anti-imperialism or anti-missionary. And we, we have pointed out that missionary activities were very much tied up with foreign encroachment, imperialist control over China. So one cannot separate 
uh, missionary activity from imperialist encroachment in various forms. Mm -hmm.